I welcome everybody to our latest Live Motocross podcast as we talk all things MXGP, Motocross of Nations and just moto in general with former GP star and now trainer Brian Jorgensen. All right, firstly, thank you everyone for listening and supporting the site. We really appreciate it. We'd also like to thank our partners in 24MX, Dirt Store, Fuxilkaline and Dragon Energy for all their incredible support as without them, none of this would be possible. All right, welcome Brian. How's life? And thanks for joining us, mate. Fresh from witnessing history with Prado and DeWolf being crowned champions there, mate, in Spain. So how are you? Yeah, I'm really good. You know, I've been been very busy with uh, with work. You know, I think it's um, it's incredible how uh, a season goes by like so quickly. But uh, it definitely uh, ended up with a, with a great highlight of of being at the the Spanish GP where they had to crown the the the, the world champion in the MXGP class, but also you know a new champion in MX2 class. So that was uh, very exciting, and uh, I was very glad that I, I went. It was a bit of a a drive, even if I live in Spain now, it was still like a three and a half hours drive. So a lot of hours, but you know what? When you have a passion for this sport in in the level that I have, and and the interest, and uh, it's always nice to go and see when the best people fight. Um, you know, to become a world champion, and and the relief that that we give, and also the stress that it causes to to actually get there. And I think it's incredible you do that many races, and you have such a few points between the you know the, the first and second of course Katie Wolf had a little bit more of a, a buff than than Horko Pardo and and Geisa but uh, yeah it was it was amazing to witness and uh, I I can only relate to that the last witness that I, I saw was was back in Mantua probably 2021 or something like that when when uh, Febra and uh, and Hurlings was vital and there was eager points when they go out to the last race that was also something that I I probably remember for the rest of my life and and this this race in the weekend you know um was also definitely something that would go down memory lane for for many many years yeah mate absolutely it's gonna be awesome we'll chat about that you'll obviously in a bit too but before we sort of get into the mxgp and the next two obviously how are you mate what's the year looked like for you I haven't spoke for a little while but it's great to catch up with you again you're busy coaching training doing the blue crew stuff big yeah. sort of year i'm guessing mate it's been pretty flat out for you no doubt so how's it all been from your perspective and what are the sort of the key takeaways from the year for you so far well you know there's always a lot of things you know i get of course a lot of satisfaction of of doing my training school like i have in red sand doing the wind so uh yeah you know, I work with many different levels of, of riders and I can honestly say that every rider gives me kind of a satisfaction, you know, no matter if they if they want to become a world champion or European champion or even national champion. But as long as I can see that, that they are progressing and, you know, obviously as a coach, you want to you wanna help people and you want to see that your tactics and, and ideas that you have built up over your own witness of, of failing and making mistakes – pays off to those riders and and that makes me really happy and uh, and that's something that I'm very very happy and and humble about that I actually have this skill to actually help other people to become you know obviously more fast but also you know the main goal is to become more safe and uh, be more aware of of the the mental aspect of riding the motorcycle it doesn't only come from <clears throat> from going out riding but it also comes from physical preparation and mental preparation before you're going out riding and in that way you will be a lot more let's say prepared for for racing as well and then of course like all the line choice and, and everything what you have experienced over the the many years of riding so uh so that's def- definitely it was really nice I've, i also had the pleasure to follow the the blue crew rider that won the blue crew 125 uh you can say masterclass last year so he basically get a free ride with JK Racing. And this year was a guy called Giorgio Orlando. Obviously, at the first round of the 125 European EMX Championship, he, uh, he crashed and broke his collarbone. So that was a bit of a, a bummer. But uh, he came back, you know, he lost a, a couple of GPs. He didn't heal up the same way that uh, Simon Langefelder did in, in one week. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how to do that. But anyway, Um so it took a little bit longer, but uh, no, it's it it really it need to make me happy, you know, helping those people and guiding those people to not only to be more safe, but also being a little bit more mental prepared for for what they have to go out and do. So it's great to be in the in the corner. I know that for a fact that I cannot change a lot during the weekend, you know, but I'm trying to put small pointers in with with everyone and try to create a lot of routines for them. So making sure that they eat and warm up and do everything what is 
it takes to be you know consistent so uh, yeah and what else and yeah i've been 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 having some some different training schools in in the uk i uh, started up with uh, with jeff parrot and yamaha uk we did a with the training school with the blue crew there and probably going to do quite a lot more next year and um yeah then what else then i've been doing you know some cycling myself and trying to keep fit and and riding a little bit i was supposed to do the the world bet uh, this year in fox hill but unfortunately you know going at in preparation up to the to the world bet i i had a big crash which uh, was actually um, set me back with 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 a little bit of a thought that uh, maybe it's not so good to uh, to come unprepared so because i knew that i had only a certain you know time available to prepare myself to get my consistency of my writing in and after that moment where i had to take like almost a month off because i made a small crack in my skateboard and i had quite a big crash i mean that crash was actually that big that you don't want to do that in my age too many times i'll tell you that so uh, it kind of also scared me a little bit because you know i haven't crashed on a motorcycle for the last eight years so and then I made this massive crash where I went over the bars and I just got thrown on the floor. And I was actually thinking, why do we do this? <laughs> why do you do that? You know, uh, but it's also, you know, even you are coach and, and you try to teach people not to crash. It's just something that comes sometimes and you don't even know where it comes from. It's just incidentally just happened. You know, you can look back and you think, oh, I could have done a little bit different. But here was just, it was a short shift you know, from corner to like a, a step up. And basically uh, the bikes just start making wheel spin. So the gearbox came really short. And because I always move my feet to get back on the pressure points on my balls and my feet to, to create more traction, I didn't have time to shift gear. So it ran out of power and I went over over the bars. But luckily enough, nothing major happened. So, uh, but then... I couldn't do the race. So I was really sorry for that because I was riding normally for Rob Hooper. Uh, he prepared all the bikes and that's where I started in, in my professional career with him in 1996. So it would kind of be fun to do like a reunion. But anyway, I went to Fox Hill and I saw the race and obviously uh, what happened actually was that both of the bikes broke down. So I would have probably not, maybe not raced anyway. So, but anyway, that was the... Um, that was another side to the story, but I, I was really pleased to to be there and see all the you know all the riders and 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 doing good racing. You know, it was it was enjoyable. It's a massive event that one, isn't it, mate? There's so many people from all over the world come to enjoy it. It's almost bigger than a GP round, isn't it? Yeah, it, it actually is. It, it's it's quite amazing. Obviously, this year as well on Saturday it was really rainy, so they didn't do any riding on Saturday. So they did everything on Sunday, which really compressed everything. So maybe my prediction of not doing it maybe came to it right because i knew you know anyway to come back and, and ride motorcycle you know in front of crowds and who you have been you know it's it's quite stressful a lot of people think well can you not just do it for fun yeah i can do that but you know i i became who i became in the sport because of certain reasons and that's because i'm a performer i want to do my best and i want my natural instinct is to win, you know, and and uh, to do that, I need preparation. And uh, when when I couldn't get that, I knew that oh, this this I'm not gonna do it because this is gonna be. You don't go around Fox Hill just doing your best if you don't prepare yourself to be the best, you know. So uh, so, but it was it was nice to be there. So that was a bit of a a highlight that I really look forward to to do. Uh, come back and race. I didn't, you know, basically I don't care if I win but I want to give it my best shot. And I do a lot of cycling, a lot of training. So it's not like I'm unfit, but I'm unfit on a motocross bike because I only spent maybe over since, since my mom died, I, I probably only spent like, you know, five hours or 10 hours a year on, on a motorcycle bike, you know, so you don't get fit. You know, it's also about grip strength and, and everything else. Yeah, it's just those reps, isn't it, mate? You just need to get the consistency and the continuity and it's a different kind yeah. of sort of fitness, like you were saying, mate. So you really need to be dialed. But no, we might see you out there next year, mate. But obviously that's sort of brought a few things into focus, mate, just how brutal it can be. One false move and it can be pretty nasty, can't it? Yeah, definitely. So it, it definitely took me a little bit down, you know, memory lane thinking, you know, my company is actually depending on me 
And uh, if if I make uh, a mistake, well, sometimes I will do because I'm also just a human. Um, it can have high, high consequences. First of all, for myself because I'm not falling in the same way that I did, you know, twenty or thirty years ago for sure. Uh, but also because I am the only, you know, person in the company that can run the company. So it kind of gave me a little bit of second thoughts. I still enjoy to ride the bike, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna compete. Yeah, no, hopefully, yeah, you do what's best for you, mate. You know, sort of all the parameters and things, the guidelines you want to meet and be within, mate. So no, yeah. we'll look forward to seeing whatever you do, mate. But yeah, I suppose the main thing is the business when you sort of got a lot of responsibilities and you've got to be accountable and you have a family. So that's the main thing, isn't it, yeah. mate? But I guess we'll go to the GPs. How was it on yeah. the weekend, the MXGP and MX2 finale? You know, that's wrapped up now. Prado and DeWolf getting it done. Obviously, you made the trip. I guess, how was the track firstly? How was the environment? How was the atmosphere? Pretty sketchy. A lot of guys had some choice comments to say about the track and whatnot, but there was many key talking points, I guess, to take away from the weekend, mate. So what were some of the highlights and I guess even lowlights, if you want to touch on them too? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the highlights, of course, is to see the best riders in the world respecting each other and actually race to become a world champion, but do it fair and square. So if I have to start out with, you know, with MXGP class, um, you know, with Geisa and, and Hwago, I think for me, that was, that was amazing, you know, to see those two people battling out and to do it fair and square. Um, what was amazing, you know, I've obviously starts, you know, you know, Prado made the, the 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 start like he always does. And that made it easy for him in the first moto. He pretty much, you know, cleared out and and uh, and you can say guy like what's his name, uh, Hurlings was riding really well as well. And and second moto, you know, when he had that little points gap, I think he had twelve points or fourteen points going out to the last moto and uh, something like that. And you could see that he took the start. He pushed really hard. He could not really pull away because Hurlings and Geiser was was straight on his on his rear wheel. And uh, he made a small mistake and then he said, okay, this is it. This was like 12, 13 minutes into the race. I was standing straight in front of him and he almost went off the track because he crushed Rudder when he landed after the, the, the right hand after the start. And he kind of said, you know what? There was four people on the line. There was guys that just behind him. Then there was Hurlings or the other way around. And then Febra. And those three or four people that was just behind he kind of just like, okay, I'm pulling over to the left side. He just went all the way left on the on the right hander and he just let them pass because the only way that you know Geiser could win a world championship was only to take him out. Mm. You know, to take Prado out. So uh so he just pulled really nice to the side, like all the way to the left and just let him pass. So he didn't have any options. Not that I think that, you know, Geiser is such a um, a cool guy. And I think he have a lot of respect for the riders as well because you know how difficult it is to win a world championship and actually to beat him. So I didn't feel that he was ever going to do that. But uh, anyway, Prado left no no option on the line and he just fall back to fourth place and, and rode it home. And, uh, and I think that was very, very clever again. You know, the way that he had planned the season or not planned the season, you can say guys are maybe also a little bit unlucky. In I think it was in it was it in China when he landed and and his foot peg broke off uh, or let's say it broke the, the the bottom of the bolt off so the foot peg was turning around because it have two bolts so basically when I saw it on TV I think the foot peg is still on why does he carry on because only if it's a little bit bent but the mechanic told me because Marcus was my old mechanic which is now the the, the chef um, HRC mechanic, you know, from, from HRC, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure if I get the trial completely right, but he's definitely one of the, the main guys at HRC. And, and he told me, yeah, yeah but the, one of the bolts fell off. So the, the foot peg was just flipping around all the time. So it was very dangerous for his feet, you know, because the feet will always come off. And then if it comes off on a, on a jump, you know, you never know if your ankle and knee is going to go uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, you know what? Just... Uh, uh, just really respect to, to those two guys. And uh, I definitely think, you know, to be honest, you both riders are capable of winning and both riders are incredible riders. But I would just say that Prado, Prado just had that little bit upper, upper hand, you know, with his riding style. And you could see that, you know, when, when you stand him and, and see him fighting for a world championship, you didn't even see the bike revving. You didn't even see him, you know, you know, rushing things he was like almost riding with a concept less is more so he was just so perfect the way he braked and i 
I actually watched one specific line and I was just standing there and I was filming it on my phone just to have it as a memory when, when I do training school because what he does, he sees the tracks with a vision that is so wide open. So there was a right-hander before the finish line, before they go into the start left-hander. And there was a lot of braking bumps in the outside or let's say in the middle of the track to the inside. But when you take inside, you come to like a really bad angle on the corner. So most people want to be outside. So there was a rut on the outside with bumps in. And then there was a line maybe that far out where nobody ridden. It's been already ripped. Nobody used that line. And he was just using that line and then he jumps around you know he he went around the bumps and just dropped into the line and you know what it's for normal people to see is like yeah okay what does that make no but when he do one like there and he gained maybe 100 of a second in that corner he would do it on 16 different corners he would do a little bit different missing the bumps so he makes sure that he's breaking is 100 straight and it's just something that you know when you've been a rider and then you are a coach. It's just something that you stand there and thinking, wow. He, he see that, you know, there's, there's 30 or whatever riders in the field. You know, top 15 are amazing fast, almost as fast as each other. And there's definitely like, you know, seven, eight riders that's on the same level. But he just chooses to go 15 centimeters more to the left, missing the bumps and dropping into that little rut. You know, the, the creativity, the perfection that he have. It's just a different level and, and there's nothing more to say about it. You know, it's just, he just have that, you know, feeling when he opens the throttle, he never go like, what, you know, and it goes really, it's, everything is so controlled. His body position is always so perfect. The way he breaks, it's perfection. And it just makes that little bit difference everywhere. And if it doesn't make a difference on the lap time or the speed or the position, it will make the difference on the consistency he can bring through 30 minutes plus two laps. And to be honest with you, that, that's only something that you can stand there and see and hear. And that's probably pretty much why I'm, I made the trip because I, yeah, you know, being a rider, you know, being a rider myself, I, I have to say, it's just, you know, how difficult it is, you know, to for me to to have 17 individual podium, finish fourth in the world and, and, and won a Grand Prix. I know how much it, took to do that you know how difficult it is just to be the best in one day you know i had i had the privilege of, of feeling that today i was the best because i made those small differences here and there you know but to bring it for 60 races and to win a world championship it, it's just it, it's just amazing i really appreciate and understand the the effort that those guys are putting in no, well and, and then and then you know seeing katie wolf which you know, like in the winter in, in, in Red Sand where I practice, you know, we stay in the same hotel and he's just playing PlayStation with my son, Sean, and and just having fun and, you know, going out riding, you know, bringing everything to the table. We went cycling together, you know, in the mountains there. And he's just such a a, a fun guy and just, just really a kid, but can really ride a motorcycle. But also a challenge, I would guess, as a coach to, to keep him, you know, when you are so young and you are a, a bit of a, you know, wild and what whatever I can, can, can say about him, you know, it's also difficult to control those young guys because they, they kind of like the feet is not always on the ground because they're not, they're still in the states between, you know, a kid and becoming an adult, you know? So it's like, when, when is the responsibility to really, you know, stay professional and do everything correct to to require to be a world champion. Of course, they go a little bit off the rail because they think they fucking they, they can fly. You know, so uh, for Ruben, you know, his coach to actually keep him on on the right track. I uh, spoke with him before the, the the last race, and he said it's not easy. <laughs> but uh, you know, what what is important is that you know. Last year, he, he also was in the title hunt of winning a world championship and, you know, finding that limit, you know, on practice where you have to push but not pushing over because when you push over, like before Tyson Tyler last year, when he broke his ankle and he didn't actually knew that he broke his ankle, but he definitely knew that he bruised his ankle. So he did Tyson Tyler and I could see and I said to Rasmus, I, I think 
it's more than just a bruised angle because I can see the way that he protect that angle all the time. You don't do that unless you know that it's actually broken. So I think he really wants to convince himself that it was probably, I think you could have told that guy your angle is broken and he would be like, no, it's not. You know, he will convince himself because he want to win a world championship. He's capable of it. So, um, so it was so great to see him finally, you know, pull it together into the last race because, you know, just let's be fair, you know, everything can happen. You know, it could even be something like Geiser with a foot peg that can go wrong. It's just such a, a little, you know, twist from, from being in control to be out of control and lose the championship. So, uh, yeah, it, it was it was really funny. I went to the after party and and had a talk with him there and uh, with Kay, and I said, you know what, it's just it's just amazing. It's, I'm really happy for you. I generally, even if I'm, I'm a Yamaha ambassador and I do the Blue Crew and and everything else, of course it'd be nice if a Yamaha rider wins. But I'm literally just glad as a as a sportsman, as a former athlete, that people succeed their dreams and they work fucking hard. And they actually achieve them, you know. I think that is you know, that is something for me that is this very incredible because I know how difficult it it is to be, you know, being on that level. And and like I said, I've never been a, a world championship, um, you know, I've never been in a position where I was in a, a world championship contender. But I was definitely a contender to win races, and and unfortunately, I didn't figure out how to be completely consistent at every race and every weekend. You know, that was, that was something that I, I didn't figure out when I was racing. But uh, I understand maybe better now as a coach what, what I could have done better and uh, what, I, what I could have gained and, and doing better when I was in the situation. But uh, I also didn't know better at that time. So it was not something that I regret and thinking, oh, I should have done this. No, because I didn't know it that that's how I should do it because I was not in a position or the privilege in my time of career where I had a coach to, to tell me what to do and what not to do. You know, this is what you're doing wrong, Brian. You need to do it like this. You're training too hard at wrong time of the, you know, so I had to learn it my own way. And probably I would be honest if I was in that position in the end of my career, having a coach, I'm not sure if he could have helped me because now I've been a, a single rider for so many years. I, I did everything on my own little intentions and motivation. And I wanted to suffer to get there because I knew if I suffered, I would become stronger, you know. So I'm not sure if, if it even would have helped to, to have a coach at that, that moment, you know. But uh, the end of the story is anyway that I'm very happy to uh, to see those, you know, incredible rider win, win a world championship. and. I hope there's a lot more to come for, for both of them. You know, Prado is going to the US, as I understand now. So it's going to be a completely new challenge for him. He's going to start as a bit of a, a, a rookie. I think a lot of the teams have uh, suggested him to start with the 250, you know, Supercross, but he's not having any of it. So I think he's going to go straight to the <laughs> to the big class and, you know, fair play. I, I think if one can pull it off, he, he can do it for sure. Absolutely, mate. It's going to be fascinating. And that's awesome insight you provided there from obviously being there. But yeah, it's just another masterclass to cap off the season by Prado, just the way he navigates and negotiates, obviously, the lines and the situations and the starts just bring it all together to put him in those positions to succeed, mate, because he not often doesn't get them. And just, yeah, like it's just a joy to watch him, isn't it? It's finesse, the precision, the intelligent the decision making, so quick and focused and, you know, authoritative too. He sees what he's doing and he makes that move. And the margins are so fine, like you said, mate. So definitely a deserved champion. And yeah, it's just a huge task staying healthy and being at that level for the whole season so I guess you look at the stats and Prado won 11 GPs guys are in Hurlings won four and Jonas won one so he was just that little bit extra that cut above wasn't he mate obviously a couple of disasters where he lost a lot of points or in the middle of the season there but yeah he certainly you know did we had to do finish the job in style and I suppose they were just neck and neck it was just those fine moments sort of cost them but yeah guys are in Prado both had 15 podiums and then Hurlings had 14 so there was that defined top three wasn't there mate just a great right. thing to see and I guess with Kaida Wolf like you said, it mustn't have been easy for him being, you know, under the awning with his teammate Lucas Curtin, who was just absolutely on rails towards the end of the season. The speed's just absolutely phenomenal. He just sort of 
doesn't really care about anything else. He just wants to win. Like second's not good enough. Every race he does, he wants to win and it's nothing short of winning is going to make him happy. So he came home, you know, just absolutely in a dominant form. But DeWolf had to manage those situations and Rasmus would have definitely had a job on his hands, like we were saying earlier, mate. So just a couple of little insights on those two guys. It's pretty cool what they've achieved, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Like like uh, we talked about it before we started the podcast, you know, Rasmus is, is a good friend of mine and I was coaching him when he was doing with Suzuki and he was one of my, you can say, hopes for, for, for the next generation of motocross in Denmark. And, uh, you know, because I was working as a national coach in Denmark at that time, he was my, you know, he, he had what it takes. Not only had the surname of Jorgensen, but he actually also can ride really good on motocross bike and he's a really good starter as well. So, uh, but but anyway, that, that was a long show why it didn't happen. But, uh, you know, to see him succeed as as a team manager because a lot of you know, that he was not in 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 charge of, you can say. And um, and to see him to become, you know, a, a, a team manager and becoming a world champion, you know, I said, anyway, Rasmus, before the race started, I spoke with him and I said, you're going to win a world championship no matter what. <laughs> so, you know, you, you cannot fuck this one up. Um, so that's always good. That's a good start, you know. But, uh, you know, to, to manage those two characters and, and not only you have to think about your manning the riders, which both want to win, you know, that they, they would do anything what it takes to win. You know, if if those two riders came head and head, you would just, even if they get team orders saying, you know, you have to, you know, treat each other with respect. We're riding for a man, you know, a manufacturer that that uh, we, we you have to live up to a certain image. But I am not sure if they get head to head and they, you know, what how that's gonna that's gonna end up. I think that could end up and on either side, to be honest with you. But to manage, like you said, that that stress, like I said, to Rasmus. So so how is it like managing those? So when you pat one on the shoulder, you 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 know the other one is watching, and then you have to go and pat that guy on the shoulder as well, because otherwise you feel, you know, and it, it's it it's kind of childish, but that's just how human beings are, you know, we are as a human being, you know, we watch and even the now you have to think about the riders, but you also have to think about the parents. Oh yeah, so he gave two clap on the shoulder on K. Why doesn't he give that on Lucas? You know, it, it, I can just imagine and how difficult it must be, and you know. If that guy is winning, or he took the start, uh, why is why is my bike not as good as his? Is, is does he run a different engine? You know, you never know what people are thinking, and the other way around when Lucas is winning, or you know, Kay, it would be vice vice versa. You know, oh, he had better suspend because the bike was much faster than mine. You know, and next weekend he will be winning on that same bike. You know, so it's it must be so difficult to to manage and and uh, and keep because then you have the fight between the riders maybe even the parents uh but then it comes down to the last factor which is the mechanics start splitting up in that little team because we want to win you know we have a lucas have a danish mechanic which which i know quite well and you know he's with a french guy and then you know he's good friends with rasmus because he worked for rasmus speak danish and then you know i don't think i don't think rasmus have either side who wins you know he's he, of course as a team manager you have to be straight down the the middle and Whoever that wins is the best rider. You know, that's that's just the fact. You give them the best opportunity, both of them, and it's basically up to them how they how they manage things, you know. But uh, he said it, it, it was I'm not gonna go in details, but he said it's, it's quite um quite a, a stressful uh, situation when when both uh, are winning, you know, one one weekend that one is winning and you're like, Okay, he's fighting for the world championship, then the other guy start winning two races in a row and there's like mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's uh it's not easy at all, but I, I think uh, you know with Rasmus, he's always very, uh, very straight down the middle. He gives the best rider, you know, the, you can say, give both riders the best opportunity, and pretty much leave it down to them. Do your job, you know. Whoever that wanna sacrifice the most, wanna want it the most, will win the race. And also with a little bit of luck, of course, you cannot. I don't believe you can win a championship without being a little bit lucky. You know, if you have to say a little bit luck with Prado, he was lucky because. Guys are landed on a rock in in China, I think, and and broke, you know, one both, which it probably happens one out of a million. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's sometimes it's it's small things that can happen, and that's why it's always so important as a rider to keep focusing on yourself 
keep believing that that, that should happen. And when I spoke with Dekali, uh, with the son of Dekali, he said the difference this year was that Prado, even if he lost points and he lost a race in Portugal, he he still kept believing that we're going to win. You know, he and, and that probably made the difference. You know, I, I, I'm all about by visualizing and manifesting your success. So when you can be saying to your success, you just lost, you know, one race, 25 points or 50 points or whatever he lost. And then guys took over the lead when you can still manifest and you can still, you know, think that you're going to be a world champion. They will, I will keep fighting. I will keep doing my own thing. I can only do as good as I can. And then he get handed that points back when Geiser lost 25 points. So suddenly you like the championship just changes in, you know, a split second. But if you don't believe between that process of Portugal and China, you know, when you, you keep like giving up or, you know, then 25 points is not enough to gain back because you already lost that. But because he kept that, you know, believe all the time, he was always second if he couldn't win. He had some bad races for sure. And there was probably times where he lost hope a little bit, you know. But the majority of time, he kept believing that he can win that world championship and fucking he did. So so fair play. I mean, you know, fair play to him, I must say. Yeah, it was so impressive, obviously. Yeah, it's just a long season. Those qualifying races with the points just add to everything. And it was a bit funny, obviously, last year, he didn't really win that many GPs, Prado, but he was always getting in those positions, like two of the three races on the weekend, he would get it done. And then sort of Geyser was sort of the Mr. Consistency this year. And then he had that drama at the end, and that was ultimately what cost him. So it's a really interesting dynamic how he's won those two titles. And obviously, this year, it was completely stacked. Obviously, he had Hurlings and Geyser, you know, to really yeah. fight him and push him all the way. But and then on to MX2, it was obviously Lucas Kuhn had actually got nine overalls and Kyder Wolf's got seven and he was managing things well at the end. And Everts and Sasha got the other two GP wins. So it's KTM group dominance, wasn't it, mate, in that 250 class? I think they got over 50 podiums combined overalls. You know, it's crazy. And then the MX2 moto wins, he had Kuhn with 18, DeWolf 11, Langenfelder 4, Everts 3, Adamo and Kuhn and 2. So obviously not the title oh. defense Adamo wanted, but lots to unpack from that MX2 class. And I guess just the way DeWolf will sort of learn to manage those situations because he was under a fair bit of pressure on the weekend you know the tough starts and the first moto didn't really go too well and he sort of worked his way into the weekend well he obviously had a few moments and he remained calm so that'll really hold him in good stead for the future won't it mate for future title battles definitely you know and and, and what i did say to to katie wolf because he probably didn't like to hear it and i comment also on his his uh i think it was instagram you know that incident that happened between simon langefelder and mm. and katie wolf i think i believe it was Turkey, yeah. And to be honest with you, if we have to to get in on that subject, you know, I think it was maybe not fair for Simon Langefelder to to be that hard on the championship contender. He would probably not like it himself if he was in that position. But to be perfectly honest, you know, Katie Wolf shouldn't have opened that door. He shouldn't have let that opportunity open. So that's what I say sometimes. You also have to be a little bit lucky because the way that he felt there could have had high consequences so when you when you re, you know reveal the the season i think he will look back on that incident you know being honest with himself and thinking i was pissed off with simon langefeller he, he he took me fucking clean out but i'm not sure if simon langefeller attention was the same at looks it, it was like two lines came together he was probably thinking I hope you're going to shut off because I am going to keep this thing wide open. And Katie Wolf didn't see it coming, which he will definitely look back at and he will thinking, I will learn from this. I will never open that door. When I'm in that position, I will never open that door like I did there because that could have been finished on the championship right there. So I think did Simon Langefeld, was he a little bit hard? Mm, I guess that KTM organization probably had like a word with with Simon and said don't ever do that again and on the other hand I think Katie Wolf will learn from that mistake thinking I, I would never open that door and letting that opportunity ever come to me like that again so so that's what I'm just saying that you know it's such a little thing that can happen you open the door you know with thinking that you can come fast and suddenly there's no space and that could have been the end of the championship so I'm glad that First of all, both was okay, but also like 
like I said, I, I was very happy for 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 K to to win his first title because it's something that you have been seeing a couple of years now that you know the things that he does on the bike, and that's why I love him as a rider because you know I spend a lot of time you know watching him in Red Sand and just the small things that he does on the bike is it's just so nice. You know he navigates the bike a lot with his you know legs and and the way that he moves around on the bike he's never stationary he's always trying to gain that little bit of a creativity sometimes he overdo things a little bit much but i would rather to be honest with you see a rider that doing over, you know doing it things you know sometimes you do like you know end overs and stop us into the corners and he 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 plays his way into his winning and i think that's uh something that you gotta appreciate you know that that he's just basically just having fun, you know, and then fucking he's really good at it, and then fuck yeah, he win a world championship, you know, <laughs> and it's you know just having fun and and not really thinking so much about what he actually does, he just does it, you know, and I think that's that's really great, and I hope, you know, like as I, I said to him and will say to him because that's what you learn as being older is that you know I hope that you can keep your feet on the ground, solid on the ground. So you can keep focusing going forward because you have so much more potential. And I'm glad that you're actually going to stay one more year in the MX2 class because I was very surprised actually to see Lucas Kuhnen moving to MXGP class in, in an age of at this moment being 17 years old. Is is I think that's for me very, very young. Yeah. They both seem like they're pretty ready, mate. Obviously, they want to move up to that 450. And, you know, the way they ride, obviously, they have issues with the starts on the 250 and they're excellent on both bikes. But it's exciting future, mate. And I guess what you're saying is there's time for that in the future. Maybe not now. Maybe stay and win that world title. Obviously, the Coonans are going to be in America in their future. So it's a lot to sort of consider at such a young age, isn't it, mate? It's a lot to take on. And, like, you got to respect them for taking on the challenge, don't you, mate? But it's an interesting one to follow, isn't it? I mean, f- first of all, I would say that if you're moving over to the to the US and you know that's where you want to go for t- 2000, you know, 2026, there was no doubt in my mind that I would stay one more year in the 250 class because the next step to the US is going to be 250 East or West Coast Supercross. So for me, to be honest with, and that's only my own opinion, it sounds a little bit nonsense to go to check a challenge in an MXT peak class which you're going to be pretty I mean I'm not saying that he's not really good because I think he's an amazing rider but I still believe that MXTP class even if your name is Prado it took him years to actually figure it all out because you know to ride a 450 seemed very easy but to race a 450 and one of our you know friends Bobby Bruce he 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 confirmed me that you know he went on the 250 and then he went on the 450 practicing anything like because of the whatever circumstances there was in in the team he wanted to do the MXGP class on the 450 and he said one thing is to practice but another thing is to race that fucking 450 for 30 minutes plus two laps and he is just a beast and and when you're going wide open and you have to consistency do that lap after lap, controlling all that power, weight, everything is 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 just something that I would not even think was possible. You know, it's it's so difficult, and that's what I'm a little bit surprised about. Such a good rider being so young, with potential of winning a world championship in the MX2 class, moving to the US, gonna use MX2 bike. I I just don't. I mean, I I just as as being me in my opinion. I just don't see the point. But uh, yeah, that's that's just me. What do you think about that? It's an interesting one. If obviously you want to make that first step at such a young age on the 250 class in America, it would obviously logically make sense to stay on the 250 and then, you know, make it happen sort of natural progression almost. But yeah, the 450, I suppose you've got to admire him. He's very determined, very driven. He always wants to test himself against the best. Yeah. And he obviously feels he's ready. And those lads, yeah. they ride a lot as well. They just love riding anything really. So they just want to compete. And they're a bit like Hurlings yeah. in a way. They just got that fierce desire to always win and show up and race and just, you know, put a flex on other people as well. You know, they don't really care 
care what other people are doing, but they like to get that sort of one up and get the ascendancy, which is like what all races do, I guess. There's a little bit of mind games yeah. going on in there too, which add for a bit of excitement. And I remember interviewing him oh, a couple of years ago now, almost before his first season in MX2 officially, and he just won a race in Spain, like a pre-season mm. Spanish championship race, and just so cool, calm, sure of himself, even back then before he'd obviously done what he's done now. So definitely one of the biggest talents in the sport of phenom, you know, got all the potential in the world. But yeah, it's just, yeah. I don't know, I guess he's driving that move, you know, that's the key thing. I think, you know, even at the Nations, he wanted to ride that 450 and test himself against Jet Lawrence mm. and Hurlings and Fever, and obviously that's not happening. Now he's on the MX2 bike, but it's going to be super cool no. just to see his career plays out, isn't it, mate? Because there's so many different pathways you can take and sort of key forks in the road and, you know, you look back on some and you regret them and you look back on some and the risk was worth the reward. So that'll definitely be the case yeah. for him, won't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, he can, you know, maybe he can pull it off. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not going to be the judge of that. I'm just, I'm just saying for, for um, a logical point of view, you know, if, if, if I was planning my own career in, in, with his opportunities, I would like, hmm, I'm going to stay one more year here and then I'm going to go to the US. I'm already familiar and probably go, yeah, maybe with KTM, whatever, or maybe with Kawasaki or whatever. I don't know what the deal is or even with Honda, maybe. I don't know. I've heard all different stories, but uh, this is just my, my my natural instinct. That's how I think. But but uh, like you said, it's it's a chance for him as his career, and and I hope for him he can he can pull it off. And uh, but you know to to cleanse a title on his first year in the MXGP class, um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it would be un, unlikely, you know, that that he can do it. Uh, because you know, I guys that did it, which was completely surprised. <laughs> you know, for him moving from that Honda slow two fifty Honda, which he rode absolute the best capability he could on that bike, to move up to the MXGP class and become a world champion in his first year, I honestly I didn't I didn't see that coming. I would have thought he had so big crashes because he was not treating that two fifty with any respect. He was just pinning it everywhere, but that's because the bike didn't have power, so he just had to ride. They're absolutely out of it, you know, and uh, and I uh, obviously be with his talent, and and he figured out, oh, I cannot do this on this bike now. I have to be more smooth, and then he took that a little bit of aggression style in to be smooth and consistent. But we have seen some crashes, you know, in Madley as well on that big step up where he rolled, where you had that big crash a couple of years ago where you thought he's dead, you know, and he just jumps up before the bike stopped, you know cartwheeling and just jump on the bike again you think hmm. how did you do that so uh, so I'm not saying that it's not possible but it's going to be interesting to see that challenge and uh, hope for the best for him Unless the plan is to go 450 Supercross, which is probably way too big a step against those guys that have been doing it for most of their life. You know, it's such a huge task. Obviously, like you're saying, to ride Supercross and then to race Supercross like Prado found out, he actually handled it really well. But to step up, you know, before you're 20, essentially, against the Lawrence Brothers, Tomac, Sexton, Webb, Plessinger, Anderson, Roxon, Jay Coop, Mookie, Christian Craig, like, this is elite riders. That's just to get a top 10 is a huge challenge for those guys. So to do it, yeah. unless you want to do that 450 step, which is extremely unlikely, it is a tough one to sort of work out why in some ways isn't it mm, yeah but anyway we, unless we you want to stay in that. gps as well that's a good option if you wanted to stay in mxgp but i don't think that's the pathway is it no i mean i also don't know his options you know i'm i'm not you know ktm so i don't know maybe it's the ktm that made this call and said this is this is your option who knows but, but uh, that would only be him that knows that the truth behind that but uh yeah, definitely a, a couple of, of different changes. There's a couple of other MX2 guys that are moving out to the MXGP next year. One of them is Mikkel Horror, which is, um, you know, of obviously being being Danish, I'm going to be very interested to see and uh, who he's going to sign with and, and, and what team he's going to ride for. He had a great um, year, didn't he? Yeah, it was, it was really great to see him because you know always that he had potential. I think still a little bit up and down, but, you know, I think overall he had an incredible season and you know with with the triumph coming in and having two riders in the top 10 in the world is just I never heard of in in my life and uh, that is just uh, you know a, a, a massive um congrats to to triumphs of of actually doing that you know coming in that that didn't you know there was no bullshit they came in with with you know all the all the, the structure and you think, yeah, yeah, but let's see if the bike can actually ride. But fuck, you know, they backed, they backed it up. I must say, you know, big respect to uh, to this company and, and the people behind it because uh, they proved that was not here just to 
for the show. They was actually here to, you know, to to do some serious business, and they definitely did. So uh, well done to them. Absolutely, mate. It was a really great year for so many reasons. And obviously, we're going to cap it off this weekend, Motocross the Nations. You're going to be there, aren't you, mate? It's pretty exciting. Obviously, there's just such a stacked class. There's been a couple of injuries that have switched things up, but it's going to be so fascinating just to be there. For your perspective, to see it all, obviously, Prado's last race, essentially, before he goes to Supercross with the Kawasaki, of all reports are to be believed, mate. Awesome to see that. And obviously, that MXGP class, we'll just touch on that. You look at the list, obviously, Jet Lawrence, Hurlings, Fevra, Tomac, Roxon, Geyser, Prado, obviously, C. Ewa, Hogmo, Gifting, Searle, obviously probably not where he wants to be on the Ryder 250 all year, but just the star powers, just a massive amount of heavy hitters there, mate. So you've just been for a treat watching it alone, won't it? Well, you know, I'm, I'm always excited to 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 see, you know, everyone there. Of course, my job at Motocross of Nation is to take care of the blue crew. I have about 120 riders, you know, to, to take care of. So uh, that's going to be a busy weekend for me, you know, traveling on Thursday and, and getting everything set up on Friday. And But, you know, I always have time to uh, to to watch the races, not so much on Saturday, but on Sunday because we do the blue crew in the morning, and then you know the the rest of the day of motocross and nation last year I had the, you know the privilege to see, you know, is this Jet Lawrence really the 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 shit on a motocross bike? And you know, if I take the first couple of laps, I would thought like he's fairly good, but then after ten minutes, he that guy that kid just kicked in, and he was definitely living up to what you have heard, and uh, wow. You know, he he was just picking off the riders one by one, like he already. It it was kind of a, a um a rewind of what will happen. You you can see that the tape has already been played. He kind of knew how things would play, and and that was fascinating in 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 my point of view when I watched him ride. You know, the way that he set up the pass, and and let's be honest, like Erne is not the best track to pass on. Because it 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 even if it looks like a big track, when you're actually on the track, there's not a play a lot of places where you can actually switch lines and do things. And he just made it after ten minutes when he really got start warming up, he just made it look so easy. And and I was very surprised at that. And it was it was actually a, a kind of a life experience standing there and seeing. You know, of course, also being France when Maxine you know, really did some incredible racing, you know, and hearing the crowd, it was also something that I will probably remember to the rest of my days. You know, you have some epic moments in, in your life. And and this was definitely one of them to, to see him, to see him ride like that. It was just uh, amazing. So he's obviously going to be really good. I'm sure that Prado, you know, being a world champion and coming in with that confidence from the way that he rode last weekend, uh, this weekend just passed. He's going to come in with a lot of confidence. And of course, he wants to win. Uh, the Spanish team, in my opinion, maybe doesn't have the the team to, to, to be a top contender. But I'm, you know, you, you never know. That's the great thing about racing. You never know. Uh, but the, yeah, the US, you know, with Tomac coming in and, and if he can bring that beast mode that he, he, he definitely is capable of. And, you know, Ken Roxon is going to be, you know, a surprise a little bit like last year when he whole started, I think, the second moto and and was lead, was leading for, for some laps, you know. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of uh, great riders there. It's always, you know, there's nothing more uh, satisfying than seeing the best riders ride in the world. And, and especially because when you have been a rider and you know how difficult it is and then seeing those, you know, the best riders fighting against each other, is it's something that, I really enjoy to watch and, and the great atmosphere, you know, there's, there's a couple of places in the world that can, that can host a, a, a MX on a, a motocross on nation. And that's, you know, France is one of them. We saw that last year with over a hundred thousand people there. It was just unbelievable. And then UK it's, it's medley. It's, it's, it's a very interesting track. It's good for the spectators to have a look. So a lot of people are going to be there. And then of course, like I never actually, been to the US for motocross and nation. Uh, but but they are definitely also in Germany. I think those are the, the four four or five countries in the world that can really host uh, a motocross and nation and, and they have the capacity to uh, to actually make it great, you know. So uh, it's gonna be an interesting weekend. I think uh, I would have loved to see Hayden Deacon uh race in life, you know, uh, but but obviously that didn't happen because of uh, of his of his hand and the operation. 
but you know it's going to be a, a great weekend. It's going to be some incredible racing, and um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Who do you think is going to win? Being Australian, mate, I'd like to think the Aussies would get it done with the Lawrence brothers and Webster, obviously all on essentially factory HRC bikes. Obviously, Australia's never won it before, mate, but it's going to be such a challenge. Obviously, you've got to get that result from Webster, and he's, you know, following Australian motocross too. You know, he won the title on the last day. He had a hand injury, and he managed to just get the job done, and he finished level on points with Jed Beaton, but he won because he had more wins. So he's sort of, you know, he's recovering from that, and then he's obviously been in the prep in Florida with the Lawrence brothers, with the team working on the bike and just getting dialed and getting comfortable back on that two. 50. So he's obviously a 250 champ in Australia. So he's an elite rider in his own yeah. right. So you saw what he did in America when he came over for those couple of rounds. He got the whole shot one and battling it in the top 10 well and truly. So it'd be really good to see how he does. It's kind of hard to go past France and Netherlands as well. Obviously, France have the same team. You saw what they did last year, mate. Obviously, Renault has had his issues with injuries this year. Fevre's had his ups and downs. Bial's had a really good year, won that Supercross title. And, you know, they're going yeah. to be so hard to beat. And the thing with Netherlands, mate, and you can talk on this after I'm finished, I guess, is the starts for them. Obviously, Hurling's had his issues with starts. The Wolf has issues with starts on the 250 especially and then obviously Koldenoff came in for Valandra. Obviously you've done a lot of work with Valandra this year as well so it would have been awesome to see him sort of you know there but obviously that injury stopped him. He was having a great year in MXGP mate so it's going to be so interesting yeah. but I think there's kind of your top three in the USA obviously in there as well but yeah Germany, Roxen, Nagel, Langenfelder that's a really good team so it's going to be so fascinating to see how it plays out mate but I guess what are some of the keys to success for you mate and who's your favourite? Um, yeah, for, first of all, Motocross on Nation, you know, from my own point of view, I cannot remember how many I did. I probably did seven or eight of Motocross on Nations. And obviously, I was uh, never in a position to, um, you know, we were just we were just happy if we can get into the A-final. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, it's, it's never really been an event for me where I wanted to go, you know, take huge risks for the, for the team. Of course, the two risk that I thought it was was needed to do the best what I could for myself. I had a couple of, of moments in my career with with especially with qualifying, you know, in nineteen ninety eight we did Fox Hill Motocross of Nation and there was the first year that Ricky Carmichael came over and he was just won the, the Supercross and the outdoor one two five, you know, uh, AMA championship and and that year in ninety eight we had the world championship in Fox Hill as well and I had my first pool position in the one two five. So I kind of knew that I could ride quite well around that uh, track. The bike worked really good there. But with those up and down hills, uh, with with being on pretty much a, a stock Suzuki with a little bit modified, and, you know, I probably knew that I was going to get my challenge going up the, star, the, the steep hills, you know, with with being 78 kilos compared to, to Carmichael that was on a pro circuit and probably a lot lighter than me. So, we had a we had a pretty good scrap on the first couple of laps and <clears throat> and he actually passed me going up that hill and uh, I uh, jumped past him going down the hill and unfortunately I clipped his front wheel in the <laughs> in the corner after and he fell down like I, I think it was on the second lap <clears throat> and got quickly back up again and I just knew that okay now it's time to go and you don't look back now because I could just hear the crowd and I could hear him coming closer and closer because the crowd. Because I was, you know, riding for a British team, the actually British rider was behind me. <clears throat> so I just gave everything and um, actually won that won that qualifying race on Saturday and was probably the first European rider to to beat Ricky Carmichael. So that was kind of my highlight of my of my motocross of nation days. And uh, and later got to to fight a little bit with him in 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 Erne in qualifying race on Saturday <clears throat> when I was riding with Factory Yamaha. So. Yeah, you know, I had some 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 up and downs in, in motocross and nation. My last motocross and nation, I did two thousand six in Madeley, um, where we didn't <coughs> unfortunately qualify for the for the A final, but um, finished second in the in the B final. So uh, I think I I won a finished second in in that that final there, <coughs> but probably one one of the few races where I thought. I'm actually glad that I'm not racing because it was Stefan Evert's last race of his career. It was supposed to be Carmichael's last race of the year, but he got injured a couple of weeks before. <coughs> Sorry. And they sent uh, James Stewart instead. So now there was James Bobber Stewart against, you know, Stefan Evert, which was probably one of the most legendary and and incredible epic races that I've ever seen in my life. When, when Stefan Evert's passed 
James Stewart on the outside standing up in those deep rut off camper, and it just made him look like an <coughs> like an amateur and just pulled away. And and hearing the crowd and and everything behind Stefan there and and yeah, it was it was amazing. And and like I said, for, for myself, it was my my last race at Motocross of Nations. So <clears throat> I'm really I'm really looking forward to go there and, and race. And you know, I don't have any favorites. <clears throat> I think always as a former rider, you know, I let the best man win. And uh, and that's how I how I see it. But uh, this is definitely gonna be interesting because in every team and that was the same last year, <clears throat> only France probably didn't have a weak link. Uh, mm. you know, you, you cannot say MX2, MX Open, MXTP, all riders was fucking capable of even winning a world championship or were was there was two world champions, uh three world champions. So MX2 world champion, uh MXTP world champion Roman Febra, and MX2 world champion Maxime Renault. So when you have three world champions, there's not really a weak link. But Australia had, you know, two good, and I don't remember the third rod, but it was a little bit weaker link compared to the Lawrence brothers because they are so, they are so incredible good, you know. So, and the same with Germany, Roxen did an incredible race. I don't know who was the, the the second or and third rider, but every team pretty much have like a, a weak link, you know, and uh, that's why I, <coughs> you know, think France, of course, have have a great opportunity, you know. Maxime have to ride up to his best capability, but we know what that that kid is capable of for sure. Uh, he was not riding that well in the weekend, and he was very. He came over to me because I I said to him I drove all the way from where I live to see you ride live this year because I haven't seen it, <laughs> and I also said to him you didn't actually impress me this weekend, and he said I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, and that that's the way he is. You know, he he's they that guy you you don't have to tell him when he does something bad because he is fucking pounding himself and you know into the weekend to perform better next time. And he's he's actually literally embarrassed of when he does something wrong. It's not like he's just ah oh, whatever. You know, he he's he's he writes with so much heart that kid that he wants to win more than he wants to breed almost, you know. It's it's amazing. So I think he he's definitely gonna be he's gonna be training with Team France to today. They uh, they are in Ernay today or Saint Anthony, one of those two, and train with the French team. And they're gonna be that tomorrow as well. And he will fucking he will be there. I'm yeah. sure he will bring the 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 the, the beast. That yeah. is for sure because uh, he that that's what he's capable of. That kid is just unreal. I, I I cycle a little bit like we spoke on previous podcasts. I cycle with him in the in the winter in in Calpe a little bit together with Calvin and and him and he is just he is unreal. I think I can consider myself you know even if I'm getting almost fifty years next year, so I am getting older. I realize that, but I feel I'm in pretty good shape and I have some good legs to to cycle. And he is just like on a on a level that I've not seen with my own eyes before. So he, he's unbelievable. He's so strong that kid, you know. So um yeah, I definitely know he's gonna he's gonna bring something good for the weekend. Absolutely so mate. He's a weapon, isn't he? Him and Tomac will hit the beast mode and obviously Renault I want to impress you if nothing else, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> at, least, at least impress himself. That's the most important, you know. But uh yeah, no, I think it's going to be a great weekend. And I just hope, you know, if you can hope for anything, you can just hope for a little bit good weather or at least not mm. a lot of rain. I have not even looked at the weather forecast because I don't want to. Uh, yeah, you know, and and we all know that even if we look at the weather forecast, it doesn't matter because it's, it can change so quickly anyway. But I'm sure it's going to be an epic motocross of nation no matter what. And the British fans are going to make it, you know, make it count. So and and I'm sure the riders are going to do that as well. So looking forward to it, and and mostly I also looking forward to to work with the Blue Crew again. It's an amazing event for those small kids, 65, 85, and one two five. You know, coming to ride, and you know, ride in front of hundred thousands of of uh, fans. It's it must be amazing to be seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, sixteen years old, riding and racing in front of that big of a crowd. So. I'm really excited. There's a lot of parents there. You know, you have to control and, you know, there's a lot of questions, but 
to be honest with you, it's all worth it when everyone is having a good weekend and, and you know, the, the, the best will win anyway. No, it's going to be awesome, mate. And I hope you have a great weekend as well. That sort of wraps up to the hour, mate. So, yeah, definitely yeah. like to thank you again for joining us, mate. If you have any final thoughts, you can share them too, mate. But, yeah, it's been a ripper podcast and we'll definitely do another one. Yeah, no, I, you know, I just want to wish everyone, uh, you know, a good motocross nation. And, uh, you know, if anyone looking for, for coaching or whatever, they can go in on mx8.dk and see the the I have quite exciting you know program coming up during the winter starting from November where I have uh, physical uh, camps and uh, that means that they are coming down here to Spain we do cycling we do fitness and they will get like a fitness test and a program to work with in the off season and then obviously I'm going to start doing the the preparation for for next season already beginning of December in Red Sand and going to be carry on uh, doing that for uh, until March so going to be really busy but you know again if you go to work every day and you don't feel that you go to work i think i hit the, the right spot where it's where it's fun you know so uh, yeah i really enjoy doing it so um, that's that's going to be nice yeah well said mate it's absolutely awesome it's been great to have a chat to you mate to hear your insights and we'll try and do one next week maybe after the nations if you have time but before we let yeah, you no go problem. obviously thank the partners in 24mx dirt store fook silkaline and dragon energy for all their incredible support as without them none of this is possible all right thanks again brian all the best and have a great day mate uh, thank you and you too no worries mate have a good one